Hi, this is Rod Bryant. Welcome you to another class on Shabbat. This is actually labeled Shabbat 2, the Patriarchs and Shabbat. Before we go on, I would like to invite you to join us on Sunday evening at 4 p.m. for a Q&A session for those who are attending this class and also Noahides from literally all over the world. We now have practically, uh, I think, 187, 189 number of people that are registered in this course, that are taking this course from all over the world, from regions that you wouldn't even know that would be interested in Torah, all the way from South Africa to Burundi to the UK to Europe, all over the world. And welcome the great established alumni of this course, and we appreciate you joining in. Don't forget, 4 p.m. Central Standard Time is the Q&A session. We'd love to have you there if you're interested. Write us an email to netiv, N-E-T-I-V, center, C-E-N-T-E-R, at gmail.com, and we'll put you on the mailing list as soon as possible. In the last lesson, we saw there is a positive mitzvah upon all non-Jews to remain constantly engaged in the world. And later on, hopefully, we'll have a class that explains what this means. This does not mean uh, constantly working 24-7 without rest. There is a uh, paradigm that is about the people of the nations who constantly engage in creating in the world as a very positive mitzvah. And this is stated in Sanhedrin 58b. This mitzvah, by default, prohibits non-Jews from observing any 24-hour rest period for religious reasons. This is according to Maimonides. This law applies equally to all non-Jews, including the Ger Toshav, and Noahides. We saw from the Midrash that the Jews were commanded to partake in the divine rest of Shabbat. Their observance of Shabbat was established as a sign of their unique covenant with God. Yet, we're taught that the patriarchs kept all the mitzvahs. This would have, of course, included observing Shabbat. Considering that the patriarchs were Noahides, how do we reconcile their behavior with the halakha? In Talmud, Yama 28b, the sources teach us that the patriarchs kept the Torah. Our forefather Abraham kept the entire Torah as it is written. Because Abraham obeyed my voice, this is the quote from the text, and observed and my safeguards and my commandments and my statutes and my laws, why not say that the verse speaks only to the Sheva Mitzvot or the seven laws? His response it also refers to circumcision. Therefore, the verse must speak of the seven laws, more than the seven laws. Rabbi Barchai responds and then says, it refers only to the seven laws and the circumcision? Rav said to him, if that were the case, then why does the verse state my commandments, my laws? This implies that Abraham kept the entire Torah. Rav Ashi said, our forefather Abraham fulfilled even the rabbinic mitzvahs or the laws stated when it says my laws, my Torahs, implying both the written and the oral Torah. Now, many of you would be scratching your head at this point and say, well, then how did he fulfill all of the Torah to include the oral law before Sinai? That's for a later discussion. Many later commentaries hold that Rav Shmiel Barchai, that the patriarchs only observed the Noahide laws plus the other mitzvahs spe specifically commanded to them. According to this understanding of the Talmud, the patriarchs did not observe the Shabbat. There are a significant number of commentaries, however, who agree with uh, Rav Ashi. According to them, the patriarchs observed the entire Torah, the oral Torah, and possible even later rabbinic decrees. This view requires a lot of explanation, and at this point, I don't have the time to get into it, but we'll attempt to take a stab at it later on. The most obvious question is, how did the patriarchs know the Torah before it was given? There are many good answers to this question, the most famous being that they knew through the Holy Spirit, a divine inspiration, which is just a tad bit below prophecy. This question, though, is nowhere nearly as difficult as the one posed by Leviticus 18.18. 18. States, do not marry a woman and her sister. Yet Yaakov married two sisters, Rachel and Leah, despite the explicit Torah prohibition. How is this possible according to those uh, who say that he observed the entire Torah? 
there are many examples of patriarchal behavior appearing to contradict the Torah itself. According to the literalist interpretation of Rav and Rav Ashi, and the uh, the Torah observance of the patriarchs must somehow be qualified to explain these contradictions. Many of the greatest Torah scholars in history have tackled this question and arrived at a number of different solutions. For example, Ramban in Genesis 26 verse 5 states, the patriarchs only observed the Torah in the boundaries of Israel. This may be tied to their knowledge of the Torah via Ruach HaKodesh. Makes sense. The Maral of Prague writes that the patriarchs only kept the positive commandments, not the negative commandments. Uh, writes that there are indeed problems explaining how Yaakov and Yitzhak kept the Torah. His solution is simply disagree with the early commentaries, writing that only Abraham kept the Torah. Indeed, the Talmud only states that Abraham kept the Torah before it was given. Almost all other commentaries disagree, holding that Yitzhak and Yaakov also kept mitzvahs as well. The Or Hachaim to Genesis 49 verse 3 states, though they kept the Torah, it had not yet been revealed and was not yet therefore truly binding. Their observance of the Torah could be modified by prophecy. When they delved into the Torah, it was due to prophetic instruction. Also, the Das Das Zechanim to Genesis 37, 35, Nefesh Hachaim 21, since the Torah did, uh, had not been given, the patriarchs had no actual obligation to observe it. The patriarchs were empowered to make judgment calls that for the sake of building a people. This sampling reveals a, a trend, and most explanations of how the patriarchs kept the Torah render their observance of Shabbat irrelevant to modern Noahides. A further problem is that many commentaries explain that the patriarchs were not 100% Noahides. Once they accept the covenant of the circumcision, the patriarchs were considered Jewish to a degree, permitting them to partake in Shabbat. This also precludes their observance from having many relevance to contemporary Noahides. Therefore, to learn anything useful from the patriarchs, we must seriously narrow our question. The exact question should be, how do we explain Shabbat observances of the patriarchs according to those who hold that the patriarchs were 100% Noahides, and those who hold that they kept to the Torah exactly as we understand it, keeping the Torah? Although many have written about this and how the patriarchs kept the Torah, the cross-section of those commentaries discussing our specific question is very small. Number one, let's talk about the labor of the Noahides. What does it mean when they should should continue laboring or if a Noahide decides to the cessation of labor? Uh, first, look at the verse prohibiting Noahide's observance of Shabbos. Day and night shall they not cease. When the Torah prohibits Gentiles from observing the Shabbat, it is telling them that they may not refrain from labor for an entire day. What type of labor are we talking about, though? The Benyan Tzion makes a brilliant observation. That is the 39 prohibitions of labor, the 39 melachot for Shabbat. The Torah's concept of labor for the purpose of Shabbat were not articulated until Sinai. Since the details of these labors were not previously known to the world, they could not be defined of a definition of labor used in regarding the Noahides and their prohibition of observing Shabbat. For example, according to the 39 uh, prohibitions of labor, 39 Melachot, defined at, at Sinai, carrying a needle in a public domain is considered a prohibition of labor for a Jew, that is, on Shabbat. However, if a Jew carries a sofa up downstairs in his home in Shia, it is not considered labor and is permitted. And if you want to get in to understand the halachot of Shabbat, that's a different subject and could take a lot of time. Therefore, Sinai, however, the definition of labor was entirely colloquial. Therefore, the prohibition observing Shabbat for the Gentiles was only referring to from the colloquial definition of labor and not on the Jewish definition of labor. When the patriarchs rested, they observed the Torah 
Jewish definition of labor, which was not prohibited for them as Noahides. However, they did not refrain from colloquially defining forms of labor. According to this understanding, Gentiles are only enjoined against setting aside a day refraining their jobs in uh, regards to yard work, home repairs, etc., because of religious reasons. However, observing the Jewish definition of labor, or Shabbat, is not a problem. It is not a type of labor from which they are prohibited from resting. The definition of the day, let's look at that. The Panim Yafos also makes a remarkable observation. The verse states, day and night they shall not cease. The verse indicates that the Shabbat may not be observed by non-Jews, is one lasting from daybreak to daybreak. After all, the verse states day and night, not night and day. However, the Jewish Shabbat, the one command commanded at Sinai, lasts from nightfall to nightfall. The patriarchs kept the Jewish Shabbat, that is from nightfall to nightfall, which was never a prohibition for Gentiles. This opinion would apparently permit Noahides to observe Shabbat in the same way as Jews. However, the Panim Yafos definition of day as daybreak to daybreak is disproven and rejected by numerous later authorities who find it of great variance with the other established areas of halakha. Let's look at the circumstances of the pre signing Noahides, that is, the patriarchs, etc., and their children. The Mary explains that the circumstances of the patriarchs are fundamentally different from from that of later Jews. He holds that the reason Gentiles are prohibited from observing Shabbat is because a Gentile is not permitted to imitate the Jewish faith. However, before the giving of the Torah, there were no Jews, therefore there was no point of prohibiting Shabbat observances. But, wait a minute. Wasn't the key verse in, written in Genesis? This is long before the Jews were commanded to keep Shabbat. If there is no point at that time in prohibiting non-Jew Shabbat observances, then why is the verse written in Genesis? The Meri understands that it is written here for future generations. The Meri would therefore prohibit any modern Noahide in observing Shabbat. Now, Let's talk about the patriarchs and monotheism. Rabbi Meir Plotzik, in his writing, refers to an interesting and unexpected view. He says, the Talmud states, Israel is not governed by mazel. Mazel is a broad term referring to the created agents and mediators, both angelic and physical, of God's providence in the world. It includes the notion of the stars and the constellations, the physical and transcendental forces in the universe. These entities form a vast mechanism channeling God's providence to the world. Before Sinai, all nations of the world were subjected to this mitigated divine providence. At Sinai, however, the Jews were taken out from this system and became subject to God's direct and ultimate oversight. God signaled this new status by commanding the observance of Shabbat, by asking Israel to share in the divine rest for the seventh day. This is the intent of the verse. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, You must keep my Shabbat, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you, Exodus 31, 13. Given the Jews... A portion of Shabbat was a sign that they were no longer subjected to the cycles of time, seasons, and stars and the lesser providences. The non-Jewish nations are subject to mazal. Hence, they must observe the cycle of time and days. When a non-Jew observes a religious Shabbat, it is an attempt to lay claim to a unique providence of Israel to cast off the mitigating forces of creation. Now, let me pause here to say, I doubt any one of you considered the fact that if you were to try to observe Shabbat as an Orthodox Jew, you were attempting to mitigate the forces of creation, because how in the world would you even know that existed? The point is, a person that would attempt to observe Shabbat in the most stringent manner in some way is muzzling himself into a relationship that he has not fully been qualified for. 
This is why the Midrash describes non-Jewish observance of Shabbat as an interposition between a king and a queen. And remember the story, a person comes in, a king and queen are having a meal, and then a person sneaks into the, to the uh, banquet dressed up appropriately, but yet interfering into a private affair. This unique relationship, it would be considered rude. However, God commanded Abraham, exit from your stargazing. Israel is not governed by Mazal. God was telling Abraham that from that point onward, he would, would merit God's direct providence and no longer be subject to the influence of Mazal. Therefore, Abraham was permitted to observe Shabbat fully. Chimdas Israel further explained that Abraham merited this providence by disavowing idolatry. This explains explanation fits well with Rashi's opinion that a ger toshav must keep Shabbat. Assuming Rashi defend, defines a ger toshav as one who only does not worship idols. However, it appears from the Talmud, assuming a change in providence is the underlying factor. This change only applied to Abraham and his descendants, but to none other. Ben Yenzion, states non-Jews are prohibited from refraining from colloquially defined types of labor. They may choose to refrain from the 39 melachot. The prohibition is only on observing a Shabbat for daybreak to daybreak. However, the definition of day as daybreak to daybreak is difficult. This interpretation is rebutted by many of the later authorities. The patriarchs were Noahides and did keep Shabbat. However, the prohibition against Shabbat observance didn't apply at the time. The Hamdas Israel states, because they were not idolaters, the patriarchs merited God's direct providence. Shabbat is the sign of such a providence. This interpretation is precluded by Tosavos, though through and from 28a. Raf Safra said the time of the afternoon prayer of Avraham, which is Mincha, is when the walls began to grow dark. Rab Yosef said we learn halacha from Avram, according, and, and of course, this is a surprise objection, comes from Rabinu Tam, the, says, and, and many others explain that the halakha practices cannot be learned based on the conduct of the patriarchs before the Torah was given. God's explanation for the world and the way in which we relate to God fundamentally changed at Sinai. Therefore, the Hamdas Israel's conclusion is not practical. From the above opinions, only the Benyan Zion's regarding the nature of the labor of Noahides reminds the patriarchs to keep the Jewish Shabbat, yet engage in colloquial definition of labor. The conclusion remains, because it is a valid halakha interpretation of all its own and is not dependent on the behavior, status, or actions of the patriarchs. However, observing the Jewish sabbatical restrictions may present a problem in Kedushi Dat, which will be examined in the next lesson. The summary is, the Talmud tells us the patriarchs kept the Torah before it was given at Sinai. This cannot be taken 100% literally because there are examples of patriarchs not following the Torah laws. To learn from the patriarchs' observance of the Shabbat to modern Noahides, we have to look at the commentaries that both view the patriarchs as 100% Noahides and that hold their Torah observance as identical to ours. There are very, very few views satisfying these conditions. Of those meeting our conditions, most of them do not apply to modern Noahides. There is a general rule that we cannot learn our practice from the behavior of the patriarchs. Benyan Zion's interpretation, however, has relevance for modern Noahides. To narrow it all down, the patriarchs and the observance of Shabbat. One would ask, well, Rod, what is the position then for a non-Jew and Shabbat? Clearly, as time begins to progress and more of our postmodern uh, rabbis begin to understand the text, we are getting a, a better and more clear picture. And that is, for example, Rob Schwartz encourages every person in the world to at some level uh, memorialize or remember Shabbat. 
It doesn't mean that they are to take upon the prohibitions of Shabbat as an Orthodox Jew would be taking on Shabbat, but rather as a memorial, an observance, a time of rest, a time of spending with family, of study. Those things are very appropriate. And the same thing that Abraham Avino or the other patriarchs would have done for Shabbat. Clearly, we've learned a lesson on what the patriarchs did and how it still provides us with a lot of questions. Stay tuned for the next class. We'll be right back in just a moment.